Hi everyone. In this screencast, I'm going to talk to you about the human impacts on wetlands and mangroves. Uh, so let's get started with this. Okay, so wetlands are, are a very, very important part of the ecosystem. Uh, and they're ones that were neglected for a long time, and now they realize how important they are. And a lot of efforts are being taken to preserve and restore them. So a wetland is essentially an area of land that is covered for at least part of the year, if not all of the year, by water. But it's, 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 it's shallow and it's, it's, it's flooded. Uh, they tend to be located in places where it is very low lying, often in a depression, um, uh, where there's not much gradient to the land, so the water doesn't have a tendency to flow and run off. Uh, so any place where these conditions exist, we tend to find water accumulates, at least if not perennially all year, at least seasonally during, you know, during the wet season. Uh, and so uh, there's five types of wetlands that are worth uh, mentioning here. Okay, so uh, basically what we have are, <laughs> it says five types, but it doesn't show all five of them up there. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so basically what you got is you got ponds. So a pond is essentially a, a, a small shallow uh, depression that, that's filled with water. Uh, it, it, it lasts all year. Uh, it tends to be encircled by fairly dense, both aquatic vegetation and shoreline vegetation that is um, able to have waterlogged roots. Uh, but they tend to be pretty productive areas because they're open and have a lot of nutrients within them. A swamp is a type of wetland that is dominated by hardwood trees so they tend to have a canopy over them uh one particularly important type of swamp we'll talk about is mangroves it's in the title of this uh, document because they're that important then there's marshes and again we can have fresher saltwater marshes but marshes tend to instead of having hardwood trees and a canopy they tend to be dominated by um grasses and shrubs so they're kind of like they're kind of like the grasslands of the the wet world <laughs> okay uh then we have peat bog so a peat bog is essentially it's 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 a marsh or a swamp usually more of a marsh uh it, but it's different in that the water is very acidic and very low in dissolved oxygen so that matter that falls into them plant matter that falls into them or you know any matter really just doesn't decay and it builds up and forms a stuff called peat hence the term peat moss and then there are riparian wetlands. So riparian, a riparian zone means the a river zone. Okay, so so riparian wetlands are ones that are found along the banks of rivers that have a that fairly slow kind of meandering rivers. Uh, you know, so so basically rivers that don't have a, a defined river bank to them. Like you know, they don't have like gravel sand bank, but instead they have vegetation that goes all the way to the water. That would be considered a riparian wetland. So let's just go through each of these in turn. Okay, so uh, if nothing else, just look at some pretty pictures. Okay, so so ponds are, are, are to be small and shallow wetlands that are, are perennial. They last all year. They're often, at least in North America, uh, they're often uh, the result of the actions of beavers. So I can see a little beaver dam here. You know, the uh, county I come from, you know, near my home, you know, within minutes from my home, I can go to any number of, of wetlands caused by beavers. Uh, and remember, beavers are an engineering keystone species. Uh, the shoreline here does tend to be uh, ringed with vegetation. So they, they tend to, to have a lot of habitat for many things, especially uh, for uh, animals like um, amphibians, because they're freshwater. Uh, amphibians, birds, reptiles uh, provide a lot of habitat for them. So swamps. Uh, tend, as I said, tend to be dominated by hardwood trees. This is a beautiful swamps. I mean, I, as a child, I spent a lot of time with my dad uh, paddling a canoe through these beautiful swamps of North Carolina. But they tend to have a, a canopy of, of hardwood trees. And the, the trees here are adapted. These are uh, cypress trees. You can see little, little things sticking up out of the water. They have, they have to have special um, adaptations to get uh, oxygen, uh, uh, gaseous oxygen, atmospheric oxygen down to their roots. Saltwater swamps uh, tend to be dominated by a type of tree called a mangrove. And mangroves are very, very important e parts of the ecosystem. So, so mangroves are characterized by having these roots that are supportive of the trees. So they're not very large trees because they have to be supported by aerial roots uh, that keep the, the rest of the plant above the, the salt water. Uh, and because they're growing in salt water, they have to have roots that are adapted to not suffocate and also they need a way of getting rid of, of water so they they tend to to have uh, mechanisms by which they can secrete 
salt out of their leaves usually or sometimes out of these roots uh, so you know, if you lick them you, you notice the, there's a bit of salt on them my wife and I are big time mangrove nerds I mean anytime we travel to a place that has mangroves which is where we like to go we always rent kayaks and, and paddle around in mangroves they're just fascinating and cool and sort of mysterious okay so marshes so so marshes tend to be dominated by as I said they're, they're sort of like grasslands of, of the wetland world so they tend to be dominated by by grasses and shrubs uh, so you can have freshwater ones uh, that, that have a, quite a bit of diversity in the plant species that grow there and again they're they're very much um, uh, a, a, a habitat for many species and then there's salt marshes saltwater marshes so these tend to be dominated by one particular type of grassy uh, reed-like plant known as spartina uh, and you tend to find these pretty much uh, anywhere you're near you know, where mouth of river meets an ocean uh, and because you have that meeting of the two is, you know, in an estuary environment, you tend to get a mixing of salt and fresh water. Uh, sometimes you can get, you know, like brackish water. So it's like the salinity is more than the river, but less than the ocean. Or sometimes you can have what's called a salt wedge. It's salt water down below and fresh water up above. And when I was kid, I used to go fishing there. You fish at the surface, you get fresh water fish. You surf at the bottom, you catch flounder and other saltwater fish. Um, and they also tend to be tidal. So it, it, they, they tend to move, the water tends to move up and down with the tide. Um, but they're, they're highly, highly productive areas, uh, as we've said from the beginning of this year. And then we have peat bogs. So uh, peat bogs are mostly common in Northern Europe and they, they, they tend to have an, you know, very, as I said, very, very, uh, low pH, high acidity water. That's very low in dissolved oxygen. So that things that fall in them just don't have an opportunity to decompose. And so the, uh, there's a buildup over time of this plant matter. Uh, producing a so-called peat or peat moss is sometimes referred to as. And speaking of this peat moss, okay, so here's this guy. And he's he's a Northern European gentleman. And he's digging out peat. So this is a layer of peat in a peat bog. Okay, you can see like it's all chopped up and stacked up here. And the reason is people in Northern Europe, you know, who live in the areas that are basically when the glaciers retreated, the land was really flat. Uh, and, and when succession occurred, there just wasn't the ability was so kind of pressed down by the weight of the glaciers. So you couldn't establish trees, couldn't grow there. So you just get these, these marsh grasses that grew, but people live there and they, they need, they, you know, it's more than Europe. They need heat in the wintertime. They need to be able to cook and stay warm. So they found that you, you can dig out this gook from the bottom, especially, you know, when the water level drops and then dry it out and burn it towards the winter. Now it's not the best stuff. I'm sure they're getting lots of terrible indoor air pollution as a result of a lot of particulates, but uh, it, it is burnable. And uh, over time, you know, the, this peat is basically the first step in the, in, the, in the formation of coal. So over time, there's a lot of heat and compression and that um, that tends to, to convert the, um, uh, the peat into into coal now this next thing is kind of gross and cool but it, because things don't die in there it's not just plants it's also people so when guys like this guy here are digging around trying to get at peat for the winter it is it, it's, it's not that it's common but it's not necessarily unheard of for them to occasionally like see like a leg or an arm sticking out and it turns out when they first find it, it looks like the person just died recently, right? They are perfectly preserved bodies. So there's quite a few of these people who've been found across Europe. And what's wild about them is they're perfectly, perfectly preserved. Like we can see his beard stubble. When they examine his stomachs, they can see like the barley he ate. You know, they can they can see like what kind of stitching his clothing had, you know, his little leather hat here. Now notice here, this dude was strangled. Not only was he strangled, his throat was cut. So a lot of times these people, almost all of these bog bodies as they're referred to as, are from the Bronze Age, uh, you know, and they they tend to to be sacrificial victims, and so people aren't really sure if they were like criminals that were taken out there. They think maybe they were just um, sacrificed as some sort of ritual to appease the gods of the of the bogs. Who knows? Uh, these are these are uh, prehistoric peoples or non-historic peoples. But anyway, uh, just I point that because it, it gives you a sense of how. Um, how the, the chemistry of these of this bog water prevents any kind of decomposition from having not just of plants but any kind of living matter, including people. And then we have rip riparian wetlands, which tend to be on the, the banks of slow-moving rivers. So basically, it looks a lot like a marsh most of the time. Sometimes, sometimes it can be mangroves, uh, but basically, the sides of rivers often act as wetlands. That that if you have a very gradual uh, slope down to the water, then it tends to get flooded at times, and so essentially the, the entire uh, uh, um, 
corridor, riparian corridor, we call it, of the river, is is fringed with these wetland areas. And they, they provide the same ecosystem services that they would if they were a standalone um, uh, wetlands. All right, so let's just talk about ecosystem services here. So, so this is why they're so important, because they provide some really, really important ecosystem services. So let's just look at a few of them. All right, let's talk about regulating, okay? So basically, one of the regulating surfaces, uh, services that these provide is they filter, uh, they filter pollutants and, and other, other uh, stuff, like sediment, uh, trash, out of runoff uh, and then they allow the water to be purified as it recharges. So the bottom of, of wetlands is often a place where aquifers are recharged when this water sits here and it slowly infiltrates down into the groundwater. Uh, so they, they recharge aquifers and they, they tend to, you know, clean water, filter water. They also prevent flooding, which is really important. So basically, if there's a rain event, these things, you know, these things, they tend to shrink when it dries up, and then they can expand as, as, as it gets wet. So basically, you get a big rain event, water drains into these things, they expand, but they, it doesn't go anywhere. So you're not getting erosion, you're not getting downstream flooding. So basically, they, they provide these catchments for these, these, these storm events, and, and then they, they can slowly bleed it off into a stream, they can lose it through evaporation or through groundwater recharge through infiltration. But they basically, they, they, they reduce the impact of storm events in terms of the flooding that's produced. Now, as far as supporting ecosystem services go, uh, these, these, you know, you have water, which you need for photosynthesis. They're usually open to the sunshine. So you have sunlight, they, they tend to catch a lot of nutrients. So you've got all the ingredients you need for high productivity. And as a consequence of that, lots of life tends to use them as a basis for their food pyramids. So you tend to get a lot of of wildlife that live there so you know you've got you know, amphibians you've got insects you just have a whole food web based around uh this highly productive ecosystem but it's particularly important for amphibians and uh bird populations especially migratory birds uh, as they migrate uh, a waterfowl like ducks and geese as they mi migrate you know with the seasons they need to to uh, you know as they're flying they can't fly at night so they have to stay in a, they have to find a wetland to stay in that's why one of the reasons it's important to preserve them. Now, salt marshes and mangroves play another really important regulating service, which is they prevent coastal flooding. So not just not just when they have a rain event, but if you have a storm event, uh, and this could be like a, a hurricane, a typhoon, a tsunami even. And so what happens is when you have a, a healthy, well-maintained, say, mangrove forest or a, a salt marsh, but the salt marsh has to be a little bit more extensive, but salt marshes as well. What happens is these, the waves come in, they, they expend their energy in here, and these things, these root systems are able to hold on and, and, and not be torn up. And so what happens is you just get this sloshing around, but the, the, the human habitation behind it tends to be okay. But, but unfortunately, people have this tendency to, to get rid of mangroves because they want to have a beach. And then what happens is, well, there's another stop of the waves, and you get this coastal flooding events. And when you get coastal flooding, you also get erosion, right? Because you have high energy waves that can pick up sediments and carry them off. And so they unfortunately found is, you know, people said, hey, I want a beach. So they cleared out all the mangroves. Next thing you know, not only they they not have a beach, they, they don't have a home anymore because it's just, you know, there's nothing to keep the waves from just eroding inland. So people realized, belatedly, but but still realized that the vast importance that mangroves play and, and mangroves, coastal mangroves tend to be uh, tropical. So we, we tend not to find them uh, in, in, in temperate uh, climates or, or, or northerly climates, southerly climates, uh, we do tend to find them in a lot of the world because most of the world is, is subtropical or tropical. Now, uh, salt marshes and mangroves also play a very important part in supporting uh, juvenile fish species. So uh, even, even offshore species, reef, reef fish, they, they often will move into these areas in order to do their breeding. So they're important breeding grounds for fish. And then so like they're, they're, they provide nurseries. So, so young fish, and I'm sure I've told you this before, that young fish tend to stay in there to have protection. So if a, a large predator comes in here, they just flee into these root systems and the big fish can't get in there and they're safe. So, uh, or, or if it's like uh, marsh grass, they just get in between the marsh grass. So this, these, um, both salt marshes and mangroves do play a very important uh, supporting ecosystem service to, to fish populations. So without these, you know, it, you'll find you get rid of the mangroves, you get rid of the salt marshes, you get rid of the fish, and all of a sudden, this coastal fishing village doesn't have any reason to be there because they destroyed the habitat that their juvenile fish needed. 
And they also provide uh, an important habitat for uh, coastal bird species and migratory bird species. And so you, you, you often find that these, these coastal, coastal wetlands tend to be just, just full, full of bird life. Now let's talk about some threats to these. Okay, so threats to wetlands. All right, the, one of the biggest really is commercial development, especially with mangroves. So, so you know, people are like, hey, uh, you know, like in Belize, like there's there's no beaches in Belize, really. Okay, so so be like, there's no beaches here. It's just it's just vegetation all the way to the water. Hey, I got an idea. Let's build a housing development. People like beaches, so we'll just kind of put in a beach. But it just doesn't really work very well. Uh, you, you get you, know, you get you get flooding, you get erosion, uh, you, you know, drop in fish population, but Unfortunately, people like to build commercial development with as far as salt marshes go uh, in uh, in like Louisiana near the mouth of the Mississippi River. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, so it's, it's a federally funded uh, organization, said, hey, you, you want these oil boats to be able to get in and out of the Mississippi River? I know. We'll just build canals to these, these marshes. Well, when they did that, it basically allowed erosion to happen, allowed the water to begin to flow. You got this erosion. You lost these, these salt marshes. And now when there's hurricanes – they don't get that, that flood protection anymore. So, so definitely commercial development is, is, is the main threat to these uh, ecosystems. Another one, though, is in, inland is dam construction. This isn't really such a, a coastal issue, but on riparian uh, wetland areas, it really is. So, so, I mean, so when people build a dam, and here's the thing, dams are, it's an interesting dilemma because they provide clean energy. They, they provide energy that does not contribute any carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, right? So there is you know, one way of trying to get away from global warming, but... As soon as you build it, you're going to lose the riparian system uh, upstream from it because you're going to form this lake. And now this lake is going to have waves that have high energy. They're going to erode the banks. Uh, the water tends to go up and down with usage. You know, uh, you know the, the dam operators change how much water they use. And so you, you tend to get like these barren uh, kind of muddy shoreline areas that, that definitely are not wetlands. Uh, and then downstream, there's often not enough water anymore uh, to support uh, the the continued uh, health of the riparian uh, wetlands downstream. Another threat is agricultural industrial pollution. So we're talking like sewage and uh, our agricultural runoff. So those tend to be eutrophying things, right? They they tend to bring in uh, nutrients that, that that result in drops in DO because of, of eutrophication. But also you can bring in toxins, right? So so you have industrial waste. Uh, that can bring in um, persistent organic pollutants that then can bioaccumulate in the, uh, the organisms that live there. So uh, th these tend to, to uh, not so much affect the, the structure of the, uh, the plants there. So like the, the, the marsh grasses and the, the, the mangrove trees tend to be able to withstand this um, problem. But, but the, the rest of the ecosystem that, that, that is uh, supported by these these plants tends to be deeply impacted by this. So as I said, you know, most people around the world have, have, have woken up and go, hey, you know what, wetlands are really important. Uh, who knew? <laughs> and so uh, fortunately, there's, there's, been, there's a lot of organizations, NGOs, that are saying, look, we're going to help you restore your mangroves. And the good news is you can do it. Now, it's really hard to grow a new, like, you know, climax forest, but it's not that. These mangrove trees grow pretty fast, so you can, you can restore mangrove pretty quickly. And you can you can build new, uh, you know, uh, freshwater wetlands pretty easily. So that's the good news here. Is the bad news is they, they 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 often get impacted by human, especially urban development, but they can be mitigated quite easily. So, like in the United States, uh, I see this all the time. If someone wants to build a shopping center, well, you know, this shopping center has land on it that through four months of the year is 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 covered with water. So even though even though most of the year it's dry land. You know, part of the year it's not, so therefore it's a wetland. And when it's when it's covered with water, you're going to see ducks, you're going to see geese, you're going to hear frogs. It's really important habitat, and it plays a lot of it, it provides a lot of important ecosystem services. So, uh, what um, uh, regulating uh, organizations have done, they they said, look, if you're going to build, like, like we'll permit. Some of us say, no, you can't build. There's too is, this is too crucial of habitat. Some of us say, well, this habitat. Mm, tell you what, you can build your parking lot there. You can build your Costco, whatever, but you, know, you, you had to, on this nearby land, you're going to have to construct what we consider to be an acceptable uh, uh, replacement wetland. And they've gotten quite good at it. I mean, a lot of them, they're beautiful. I mean, I was 
Jeju recently. I mean, the, 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 the constructed ones are gorgeous and, and they, they, they serve their purpose. So, so the thing is we can reconstruct wetlands uh, in most cases um, to, uh, to replace damage that we've done. I think that's it for this one. Yeah, okay. Hey, thanks for listening. See you later.